uh, the 2024-2025 the budget presentation. Uh, very familiar for all of you that have been here. I think we've passed out the, uh, the, the larger format of the budget. People are, are, are rummaging through. But let me just begin, as we often do, with a slide that's become more and more familiar, not just to those that have been to previous budget presentations, but to Californians. For decades and decades, uh, we've come to expect the unexpected as it relates to the volatility of our tax system. You can see here uh, in the orange line, those are the big three revenues. Looks like an EKG chart. Goes up during the good times, goes down very badly in the bad times. You can see some of those spikes, which I'll represent in the capital gains chart next, uh, that reflect, uh, I think, the larger narrative of today's presentation. Uh, and that is a story of correction, a story of normalization after a period of a tremendous amount uh, of distortion. And that distortion has been represented in the revenue collection in this state. Take a look at this chart. The 10.4%, uh, that's 2000, the year 2000. We've had some spikes in the past in revenue, 10.4% percentage of income tax collection, capital gains. You can see the 11.6% historically high number that was represented in 2021. And now a drop, and we look at the projections going out to about 5%. So those are just remarkable swings in terms of that revenue collection, particularly as it relates to capital gains and the disproportionate impact capital gains plays on our overall revenue. Uh, that said, the 5%, you may recall this time last year, uh, I mentioned that the average this time last year of capital gains looking back was about 5.18%. So we're getting back again, story of correction, a story of normalization. We're back at about 5%. We're projecting about 5%. Going back to what we have traditionally seen, again, after a period of unprecedented distortion. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that distortion in the context of the deficits and surpluses, though I will remind you in 2021 and the prior year, we had a two-year uh, period where we had $177.7 billion operating surplus. I'll repeat that. $74.3 billion one year operating surplus. The next year was $101.4 billion. Only the experience, you recall last year, a $31.7 billion shortfall. So again, normalization, correction after a period of distortions, getting back to what we have seen in the past. Let's jump right in. The budget this year, $291.5 billion budget, budget that we are sending to the legislature. Again, begins a process, doesn't end the process. It's a process of engagement to the conversation with the legislature. It's a process that, as you know well, unfolds over the period of time, particularly as we're the beneficiary of more information. That's why there's a May revise. That's really the prime time. Not January's budget, but the May budget. Uh, and that explains a lot of the discrepancy that invariably uh, you will inquire about uh, after not this uh, general fund uh, number, uh, but this deficit. 37.86 billion, $37.9 billion projected shortfall that we're looking to close. Those of you who've been writing about a different number, I hope you're immediately correcting that number. We have been pretty damn transparent with you uh, by making the point publicly, not just privately, that that number was not the number. But it continues to be reported as gospel. I don't know if that's good. Um, I don't know that you think it's bad. But a lot of folks are probably wondering why that won the number. Well, the, the number is representing what we'll be presenting in January. 37.86, 31.7 billion last year, 101.4 billion surplus the year prior, 74.3 the year prior to that. Volatility that expresses itself. So let's talk, and I, I tend to do, particularly when we have shortfalls, uh, about the problem 
promises that we keep, the values we promote, uh, the agenda that we hold dear. And you can see a list of issues here that I think are top of mind for the vast majority of Californians, regardless of walk of life, your ideological agenda, uh, homelessness, the issues around uh, mental health, which I think is a unifying issue uh, that we all share, issues around a safer community, issues around uh, crime and violence, education more broadly defined, and our efforts to really orient uh, a, a new narrative around career education, which we'll talk a lot more about in the next few months, our climate commitment, which is second to none, we have no peers in that space, and, and our continued economic dominance, uh, despite a lot of naysayers. But let's jump right into the homeless uh, crisis and all the way to describe it. Uh, we're maintaining our multi-year commitments, $15.3 billion. So I just want to level set with you right off the bat, and that's uh, things you know well, and they can to clean up grants, and homeless efforts to, uh, that, that have been addressed significantly through novel programs like Home Key and uh, our ongoing commitments that we've made in the past to our local uh, partners as it relates to COCs, the counties, and the cities. Uh, as it relates to ongoing commitment of an additional billion dollars uh, through the HAP program, not dissimilar to where we were this time last year, we want to work on the accountability side of this, and we want to work with the legislature, and, and uh, we will try to land uh, in May on right-sizing that commitment. Uh, but no cuts, mid-year cuts, no fiscal uh, and no cuts to those multi-year uh, commitments that you know well. As it relates to mental health, same uh, will hold here. Uh, same $4.7 billion unprecedented investments uh, in our youth. Uh, these are the wellness centers and wellness coaches that are going back in our public education system. No state in American history has invested this kind of money, 0 to 26, on our early, uh, um, well, uh, focusing on early prevention, treating, as we say, brain health early before we punish it uh, later, uh, a focus, a commitment, a resolve on children's mental health as well as building out our uh, infrastructure and including uh, the infrastructure that we're building out with our pilot, uh, eight counties, 58, the all in at the end of this uh, calendar year on care court and the opportunity that presents itself the Mental Health Services Act. 11,150 treatment beds, just shy of 27 thousand treatment slots are part of that initiative. Unprecedented opportunity in a matter of weeks that the people of the state of California uh, will determine that will have a profound impact on significantly accelerating our efforts on housing, homelessness, and behavioral health. As it relates to this issue, keeping this state safe, uh, we're not new to this. <laughs> we're not waking up to the issues. Uh, a number of years ago, you may recall, uh, the work we did uh, with our Department of Justice, with our partners at the local level, uh, our federal partners, not just our state partners and local partners. Uh, you'll see here just the efforts on organized retail theft. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, break that down. Work we're doing on interdic uh, interdiction as it relates to enforcement. That's just the enforcement side of our efforts around opioids and fentanyl and issues related to the growing concerns around xylazine, trend, uh, as it's are referred to on the streets. Uh, our community policing efforts, our nonprofit security grants, um, and by the way, that is $140 million to go back five years, but for the purpose of this slide, uh, $90 million over the four. Officer wellness, uh, we're investing tens of millions of dollars um, into addressing uh, the wellness and the well being uh, of those men and women in uniform. I'll remind people if they haven't heard it before, I'll let you know that we have been investing uh, in recruiting uh, 1,000 new CHP officers. I think we had another academy class last Friday. Uh, it's been a real success. And I'm really proud of the work that's being done at the CHP to recruit officers, to retain officers. And, and that's paid real dividends as it relates to partnerships we've formed uh, with cities like San Francisco and work we're doing in Oakland, and more work we'll need to do in Oakland. A little bit of a preview there. Efforts around gun violence and there's an additional $66 million, $67 million last year. That's sort of a multi-year uh, gun violence in the Cal VIP program. And then investments uh, that we've significantly increased as it relates to victim services. So $1.1 billion, those commitments maintain themselves. And again, there's a multi-year. You can talk to Joe and the team, finance in a moment. Uh, you can talk about what's remaining in terms of these budgets. Uh, they can walk you through all of that in more detail. As it relates to the detail, though, that I 
we specifically, and this is our own accountability sheet, but it's important for folks to know. It's one thing to put out a press release, talk about putting out money. But where did the money go? Uh, 52 sheriffs and police departments have received upwards of a quarter of a billion dollars in new grants to combat retail theft. This has been going on uh, for the last year or so. 13 DA offices to advance vertical prosecution. Um, and then we created this new unit, the Special Operations Unit, Department of Justice, with AG Bonta, who's done a wonderful job in this space, been very supportive. New task forces, prosecution teams, uh, we mean business in this space. Again, we're not just waking up to this. And just some proof points on that. The CHP led efforts, led to thousands of arrests, ongoing investigations, and uh, recovery of stolen items. We, we do, for those that are interested in this, every Tuesday. If you haven't read about it, because maybe people aren't excited to report about it, I think it's important we do Take Down Tuesday. We update people on the progress we're making, the partnerships that are being formed in 58 counties, 470 plus cities, and, um, and again, unprecedented. Never in our state history we provided this kind of discretionary grants to sheriffs, police departments, and DA's office. And, um, and I'm just really proud of the work that they're doing. Um, and I'm bewildered by some that don't even ask for the grants, but then criticize and complain. <laughs> that they've got a problem. But that's just me talking out loud. Uh, but I share that as a point of just honest accountability of the work. And, uh, uh, but those folks up there, we've got a list if you're interested, who's taking advantage. Uh, hats off to each and every one of them. Partnership at the end of the day. Uh, we need that local partnership. I say this about every issue. I'll repeat it uh, again on this issue. A state's vision and commitment is realized at the local this is on your bingo card, so I'm going to make it easy. <laughs> Localism's determinative. It's something I understand more today than I did five years ago um, before I took this job. As it relates to the job of dealing with the issues of fentanyl uh, and opioids, we continue to make investments. I referenced that $88 million, which was just on the law enforcement side. Just a reminder, and I'm really proud of this. We got 113 men and women in uniform from the National Guard that are working on drug interdiction across the state of California. We've got 63 at the border. And we doubled that the border operation some time ago. And it's just been hand in glove operation with Border Patrol and it's been a fantastic partnership with the largest land port in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the state of California. And the vast majority, uh, it's not guys with backpacks that, you know, some folks that are preening for attention say you should shoot on site. Um, where the fentanyl is coming in, the vast majority of the fentanyl, overwhelming majority of the fentanyl, is coming in through ports of entry, coming in through land ports. And our National Guard men and women are helping support and supplement some of that work for Border Patrol. No one's playing politics down there, at least in California. We're building partnerships, and I'm proud of that. And again, that's represented in the work that they're doing, enforcement not just on the border, but throughout the state, the partnerships that have been formed in terms of not just enforcement, but intelligence gathering more broadly on the regional side of the opioid and fentanyl epidemic uh, that has, uh, has been advanced, and we're committed to that. The naloxone efforts we're proud of as well. The grants, some of these things you, you know well. I'm just re repeating what you may already know, but just also reminding you uh, that that commitment remains strong and steady as we go forward. As it relates to strong and steady, a uh, strong and steady economy requires a strong and steady workforce. You can't have an economic development strategy without a workforce development strategy. This notion of career education is something we're going to take to the next level. But first, let me level set with you on terms of the commitments uh, under Prop 98. This is a Prop 98 slide, one you're very familiar with, uh, $109.1 billion, interestingly, despite a shortfall this year. The pure per pupil total is roughly what it was last year. And, and, and on the Prop 98, just so you don't accuse me of misleading you with the previous slide, that's 17,653 per pupil you see. Last year it was 17,661. So $8 difference. Not profound, which is just interesting. On a lot of levels we can get a QA and a and Joe can regale you with the history of Prop 98, the nuances and details, talk to you about why that's the case. And, uh, 
it's pretty common sense why it is uh, on the basis of uh, population and the like, but uh, uh, enrollment, that is. Uh, but, but that's the per pupil uh, on education. This relates to the commitments we've made in the past. You're familiar with some of these things. We're maintaining these multi-year commitments as it relates to addressing uh, that mitigation, uh, uh, that, or at least advancing the mitigation as it relates to addressing the issues of learning loss and advancing our efforts around learning recovery. Uh, again, that children's youth behavioral health, I, I, I continue to highlight it because, again, my wife's here. It's a point of pride, and uh, I couldn't be more proud uh, of the legislature uh, for their support of those efforts, including, by the way, community schools. That's a long-term commitment. It's something I promoted years ago, and we did it in a small way. In hindsight, it was a few hundred million dollars that first year. Billions were committed to advancing that. It's all part of this larger education reform, transforming TK to 16. Remember, we created a brand new grade, TK for all. Uh, I don't know that there are many states that are transforming their educational system in terms of investments like we are, including our education workforce, our educator workforce, the special education reforms. And you think I'm overstating that? Let me give you some highlights. Uh, you know, before and after school was a promotion, it was a promise, it was discussed. People are identified with that issue. No one's advanced it like uh, we were able to advance the last few years working with the legislature before and after school, reimagining the school day, extending the school year, looking at TK. As I said, the universal meal efforts are continuing, ongoing, arts and music, of course, Prop 90, 28 rather, will advance uh, that. And then we're committed uh, working with the Black Caucus. It was a priority. Don't touch the equity multiplier. We did not uh, as it relates to the work uh, we're trying to do to close some of those gaps, and that $300 million is included uh, from last year's budget where we had a shortfall, we committed to it, and we're advancing it again here today. As it relates to commitments that also need to be advanced, it's the compact with the UCs and CSUs to stabilize uh, their um, multi-year outlook to allow them to make investments without a short-term mindset. We're proud of that. I don't, I don't know that, you know, as a former, uh, well, current, but former active participant as a member of the UC Regents, former lieutenant governor, um, it was frustrating to be able to plan year to year, not knowing what was going to happen in a presentation like this. So here's long-winded point. We are, yes, deferring, but not delaying, and there's a distinction in the law on this that will allow UC and CSU, just for one year, to be able to borrow against that commitment. So that commitment will remain even though we'll score it for budgetary benefit. And so I highlight it and I make this point to just reinforce uh, that the UC and CSU are in a position uh, to advance those dollars. We'll just do it in a way where they'll get reimbursed for it uh, next year. As it relates to issues of affordability, more broadly defined, maintain uh, many of the commitments. You see them here, um, modest adjustments uh, as it relates to middle class scholarships. We'll continue with the baseline funding uh, that we have advanced in the past, uh, but we'll take a, a little bit uh, of an augmentation moving forward. And Joe and the team can discuss that uh, when they come up, as well as student housing. Uh, we're keeping that baseline commitment uh, and we're pulling back a little bit as it relates to uh, the efforts to balance this year. Again, we could talk more about that in a moment. As it relates to that career education, just want to reinforce that commitment and resolve and preview. Uh, we're doing, we're in the process now uh, of advancing a master plan. I know perhaps it's overused, the master plan frame, uh, but I don't want to understate uh, the consequential nature of this. This new master plan, we're working on career education, uh, looking at new pathways, these passports, and these skills maps and skills transcripts. Uh, you may have heard me in 2019 when I was here for two plus hours, uh, boring the hell out of each and every one of you, uh, talking about the Singapore model uh, and all of these other strategies. We're just rolling all of this up into this new master plan. They're going to have to, you know, uh, there'll be a transfer of power here, but I'm going to make sure this gets done uh, before uh, they pry uh, uh, that oath. Uh, well, I don't know what the phrase is, but anyway, we're going to get this done. And excited Ben and the team are working hard on this. So I just wanted to highlight uh, the career education. As always, to keep promise, commitments on climate are, are substantially there. Full transparency substantially there. Uh, but the biggest news, I think, is the work that the Biden administration has done. Uh, it's just extraordinary. I mean, a few years ago, could have never imagined 10 plus billion dollars just coming to the state 
in new climate commitments, and that's helped supplement uh, some of uh, the modest cuts we're making in this space. So overall now it's a $58 billion plus dollar commitment. It was 54 before, a little more modest now as it relates to some of the balancing. I'll get to the details, a little more details of that uh, in just a moment. But one thing uh, that we are focused on um, and uh, are very detailed in our oversight is holding big oil accountable. And climate crisis, after all, is a fossil fuel crisis, period, full stop. It's not even complex. They've been lying to us for decades. And, and that's not even particularly, uh, well, that's pretty transparent. That, that's pretty obvious. Uh, uh, but, but accountability has been lacking. And uh, California will continue to do its job to lead by example. As we are in streamlining our green energy stuff, you could talk a big game about low carbon green growth future and changing the way you produce and consume energy, but unless you get these large scale projects up and operationalized in real time, then you're misleading folks. And that's why these streamlining rules uh, that we worked so hard with the legislature the last two years become so important. We're gonna to continue to advance that cause and I wanna just thank the new speaker who's a particular uh, advocate and champion of a lot of those efforts and his commitment to continue uh, down that path. Speaking down, continuing down a path, I wanna applaud previous governors for their international leadership uh, on climate, but just highlight just some of the work we've been doing. China was significant. Japan, though, Australia, New Zealand, and Netherlands, a lot of new memorandums of understanding were signed. A lot of good work has been done in this space. I got the next level climate team, and, you know, Wade, Lauren, the rest, and, uh, and they've just done a, a magnificent job working to develop these partnerships at a subnational level. There's simply no other state in the world that is able to develop the kind of relationships with national governments as the state of California. So I, I highlight this because it's a point of pride as a Californian. And it's a point of pride as a, you know, guy is very mindful that we had the hottest year recorded uh, on planet Earth last year. One of the hottest Decembers in California. One of the hottest Decembers we've ever recorded. Uh, and this is serious stuff. Uh, so we maintain our commitments, Climate Corps. Uh, I always highlight Klamath Dams just because when in doubt, highlight something that should excite, excite people. Uh, the, the three of you that know about it. Uh, <laughs> it's the largest dam removal in U.S. history, the largest river restoration project in U.S. history. I think that's pretty exciting. And it's happening in your state. And it's happening in real time. And we all worked our tails off to get this done, and it's moving as well as the good work that's being done on Salton Sea in partnership now with the Biden administration. It's been a missing piece, the federal government, their commitment remains, and actually there's some new money in this space for the Salton Sea and our 30 by 30, just because the team would be upset if I didn't focus on biodiversity and land acquisitions. Um, those commitments are just that, commitments. Uh, water, we're also committed to continuing to do what we can. We've got that ongoing fund uh, for safe, reliable, uh, and affordable drinking water. We're consolidating more and more of these smaller uh, wells. Uh, we have a lot more work to do in this space, but we're committed uh, in this space. That's why I'm highlighting it. Uh, you can see the work on drought and flood, conservation, agriculture. Again, vast majority of our commitments remain intact. This is, again, about uh, not just promoting promises, but keeping them. Uh, sites, you know, this above, um, uh, above ground, off-stream water storage project. Uh, it was the first beneficiary of the new streamlining legislation. I highlight it because it's important for us uh, to capture during these wet years. Not dissimilar to the importance of reforming Proposition 2 to capture more, not water in this case, but resources during the good years in our rainy day reserve. It's interesting, it's called rainy day yeah. reserve. Delta conveyance also is foundationally about that as well. And we just got that ER, EIR moving and uh, there's a lot of momentum and progress in that space. 2.7, it's a familiar number. We're not cutting it. It's right, it's our commitment on vegetation management, forest management, uh, community hardening, all that work. Some good news, uh, we had some delays, some issues but not denials as it relates to the seven C-130s, we got them. They're here. Biden administration, uh, after a lot of hard work, 
meetings, Pentagon and others, uh, we finally said, can we just take these damn things and let's just stop this, you know, it, it was taking forever. So we got seven of them back, it's about 33 million bucks, and we're gonna get them all operationalized uh, and they're here. And so anyway, I just, that's exciting. I mean, seven new C-130s, you're gonna see them. Hopefully you'll never have to see them because there'll be no forest fires, but, um, but you'll see them uh, <laughs> almost assuredly. Uh, but our commitments to mitigate and reduce the intensity of these is reflected in this budget. I will say full disclosure, um, this, this is extended out. These are multi-year commitments. So you'll recall in the last few years we did three-year commitments and then you have five-year commitments, six-year commitments. So you'll see as part of, and this is all, you can walk through all this and you've got it in those 170 ever pages, you all have it in front of you. But they'll walk you through, you know, from five to seven years we'll stretch the dollars. Again, these are all incremental dollars that were benefit that we benefited when we had these big surpluses. But uh, so there's some augmentation here, but the, the, the dollar figure remains. And by the way, just really proud of the work Nancy and her team doing, Joe Calfire and others with the AI work. Um, we've really become a leader in innovation as it relates to early fire detection uh, and suppression technologies, the alert wildfire program in particular, uh, now aided by uh, AI has uh, gotten a lot of international attention and, it just highlight it because uh, it's novel and it's part of, I think, the narrative that is California. Uh, and it's part of the narrative of dominance, not just as it relates to leadership in that space, uh, but also in terms of economic dominance. Again, fifth largest economy in the world closing, uh, closing in on Germany to be the fourth. We're not done yet. Uh, don't give up on us there. Um, we continue not to give up, though, as well on the backbone of our economy, and that's small business men and women. I know a thing or two about this as a small business person with a blind trust, so I won't discuss it. Uh, but I started right out of college, small little business. One part-time employee, Pat Kelly, um, grew that to about 23 businesses a peak, about 1,000 employees. I say that as I often do, not to impress anyone, but to impress upon you my passion for entrepreneurialism, for free enterprise, small business. $4.2 billion went out in grants to small business. Over 320,000 small businesses benefited. Grants, not loans, not tax credits. Cal Compete has been, Didi and her team, I think have done a magnificent job. Um, and, and we highlight that all the time. Doesn't seem to get, again, it's like Take Down Tuesday. It would be nice if 2024 was a year of trying to find good things to focus on. Um, and there's a lot of good that's come out of Calca Peace. In fact, I think PPIC just did a big detailed analysis of the efficacy of the program, and so we want to maintain our competitiveness and, and recognize we have to compete with more and more states that uh, uh, are, well, the world we invented now is competing against us, and, and we've got a lot of people out there that uh, have, have a desire to take us on. And I, I think that's a healthy thing. Film tax credits at $330 million still there. The R&D, vast majority, there's some conformity we're gonna do there, uh, but the vast majority is still in, in place. And the Young Child Tax Credit, no one does what we do on the ITC, statewide EITC and the Young Tax Credits, those commitments remain firm. As it relates to issues of jobs, I remember uh, we've talked a lot in this room, different occasions, not just the budget, about regions rising together. Uh, back to again, state's vision is bottom up, realized locally, not just top down. And so we've defined uh, broadly 13 economic regions. We talk about California's economy is not one economy, it's the intersection of many different economies. When you're the size of 21 state populations combined, California, that's a way you need to look at economic development. So we've done that through that commitment around this regional uh, investment initiative, $600 million focusing on supporting our rural partners with unprecedented supports, we're committed to that. There's, a, there's some deferral, a little bit of the money, we're stretching it out, uh, but we're not denying those fundamental commitments. And I could put on this slide many other commitments, like $250 million for the K through 16 collaborative, that money is going out as well, uh, but I'll spare you uh, that. But I cannot spare you highlighting uh, this partnership we just advanced last week. I was down in Los Angeles, uh, it was uh, one hell of a, an event, and forgive the language, but I'm really proud of it. Uh, 
No one does what we do in quantum. You're going to hear a lot more about quantum computing. No one does what California does. NSF is only funding one state, or at least institutions in one state, it's California. No one does what we do. And no one's doing what we're doing on immunology and immunotherapy. And all of us have become experts on that because we all know what MNRA is now after COVID and everything else. So we have worked with Google. They provided this unbelievable site. It was a former mall, which I, I kind of like. When you all get all depressed and you see a former mall say, oh, my, my grandfather was here. This was a great, you know, come on. Uh, there's, it's, it's part of the transformation. And you see this old mall and you go, what's going to happen? Well, it can't get better than this. 700,000 square feet of the best and the brightest minds in quantum and the best and the brightest minds on immunology around the globe. It will attract truly the world's leading talent. This is what we do best. And because of you, um, we were able to, in partnership with the legislature, provide $200 million uh, for this institute. Its, it's total cost is 876, but the commitment from the state was 200 million. We're maintaining that. And, um, and, I, and the philanthropy has come in in a big way. It's just exciting and it gives you real confidence in our fate and future. Uh, and I had to add it. I also wanted to add, and we're going to get to solutions right after this. I want to add a, a little highlight to what we announced yesterday, because this has been a long, Gail and our team have been working a couple years on this. Uh, I wanted a little more transparency, and I think you deserved it, on unprecedented infrastructure investments in, that are coming to the state in the next 10 years, uh, not only because of our state's effort and, and our own uh, gas tax, which is not just a tax, it's a tax that you invest back into roads and bridges uh, and infrastructure, um, as well as the federal dollars. And so it's $180 billion over 10 years, $41 billion projects that are operationalized now. And these are the, the you all know, the you know, categories are well defined. But we just put out this build.ca.gov map yesterday, and it's interactive map. I just encourage people, because in your own community, what's happening? Where are my tax dollars going? You know, the, question I get all the time. And so we, we try to answer that, making this, I, I don't know many other examples like this, put a lot of energy in this. And uh, it's not perfect yet, we just rolled it out. So I, I know if you're there to say, <laughs> you know, I get it. Uh, but this is a big first step. And, uh, and we want to start doing this across the board because if there's a narrative for this year, it's about accountability. Accountability, stretching those tax dollars. And with a budget like this, it's foundational. I just encourage you to go to build.ca.gov. If no other reason, forget your professional preferences. But personally, you may want to know what's happening in your neighborhood over the next few years. Where are the projects? Are they under budget, over budget? Are they on time? Or are they years and years behind? And uh, we've tried to be as transparent and honest as we possibly can. As you just have a right to know. How are we doing? And we're not trying to obfuscate or, or, or mislead folks, but but at the same time, it's such a staggering amount of money. We kind of put it up in historic terms. We talk about the good old days in the 50s and 60s. Well, this is getting back to those good old days in terms of per capita investments. I mean, these are sort of Pat Brown era investments. And I don't think people fully have absorbed that. I, I'm slightly overstating that, but only slightly. Uh, $180 billion is real money. So you came here for this slide. Well, the next one. <laughs> And that is, how are you going to close a, a $37.9 billion shortfall? Well, here's how. 18.8, 11.9, 7.2. Uh, things that are familiar to you. You saw some of this last year. And why did you see some of this last year and this year? It's because we anticipated this moment. I mentioned that $101.4 billion surplus. 93% of that budget we set aside for one-time purposes. We maxed out on our reserves. We have a statutory cap of 10%. That's why we need to reform that. We need to capture more than 10%. That's my humble opinion. That's going to take some work. It's going to take some public support. It's going to take some education and partnership. But we maxed out on that. We paid down pension liability. We'll talk about all that in a minute. Um, and, but we intentionally, you may recall, I had a slide saying I had a goal of 99% of all that. And everyone laughed, thought it was a typo. We negotiated with the legislature, but we still kept it at 93. That was among the historical high in terms of one-time surpluses for one-time purposes. Again, multi-year commitments that we can pull back or we can extend. Again, part of our fiscal management. By the way, we have $91.4 billion of borrowing capacity in the state. 
That was at least as of November, so a few weeks ago, 91.4 billion. So from a cash perspective, from a reserves perspective, because of the fiscal planning and management, because of the one-time framework of focus, it allows us for a second year to do something again that should be familiar in terms of how we ultimately balance. And that is around reserves, a little revenue, revenue I'll talk about, which is primarily the MCO, 3.8 billion, which is very familiar. Uh, so that's not a new business tax or anything. There's no wealth tax, there's no income tax, no tax it, they're modest little things on NOLs. Uh, we could talk about it. I'm sure you all want to write about that, so you're going to ask me and I'm going to walk you through the details. Well, they'll walk you through the details. I'll give you the top line. So let's talk about that resilience. Rainy day withdrawal, we're going to pull $13.1 billion from the two uh, reserve accounts. Now, I, I don't want to confuse you, and, and we had a little, we had it out with finance, my team. Should I include the 5.7? You're going to say, wait, you mean revenue borrowing? No, this is what we included. It's exactly 5.7 that we're pulling under the Prop 98 reserve, but I'm going to get to that separate. But that's not part of the balancing, remember, of the general fund. That's separate. But I'm going to get to that. And I just want to seed you with that so you'll understand the next slide. So we're pulling 18.8 billion, 13.1, uh, and then the revenue and borrowing, special fund 1.4, 3.8 on the MCO, we'll talk about the rest. But that gives you roughly what we're doing here. But here's the good news. It still allows us to maintain $18.4 billion in reserves. This, by the way, also includes the school rainy day fund, of which we're pulling 5.7 this year. But it appears here for the purposes of understanding uh, the reserves, the overall reserves uh, that we have. By the way, you'll see a new reserve because we're adding, we added to our own shortfall in terms of our need to balance an additional $3.4 billion in this F SFEU account, which is basically a checking account. It's like a, or I don't know, line of credit of sorts, but with the money in the bank. So we were, we're going to add an additional $3.4 billion for emergencies and uncertainty. So that actually added to our burden, uh, if that makes some sense. And if it doesn't, happy to discuss it. Uh, so pull inbound, $13.1 billion from the two reserves, additional 5.7 on 98, that's not on this slide, maintaining this level of reserves for the rainy day. Also continuing our commitment to pay down long-term obligations. I think this is critical. Last five years, you can see $12.4 billion paying down unfunded liabilities. It's health, not just traditional retirement. Uh, next four years, we're committing in, in the forecast period, $8.6 billion, and you see the $2.1 billion that we're continuing to invest in paying down the long-term debt. So we're maintaining that consciousness and focus on the out years. Let's talk about the belt tightening. Again, three areas here. On the belt tightening, you may have seen a number of weeks back, months back, we said no new cars, no more travel that's not essential, no more cell phones, you know, iPhone 12 or 20, you know, you can live with the 19. Uh, what is it now, 15? So it's, uh, no, sadly, well, you guys may have, yeah, may even get the memo. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then as well as our, our fleet, you know, new cars and all that. So we did what you do at home. And, and we did that, and people say, well, hold on, when did you do that? I said, right when we got the receipts. So let me remind you of something that I could have began, this long preamble or longer preamble. All of this uncertainty happened because we experienced something we've never experienced in modern history in this state. We didn't collect taxes in April of last year. Why is there a May revise? There's a May revise purposely because it allows you to revise your estimates on the basis of what you've actually received in terms of revenue and tax collection because we all know tax day, or we used to in California, used to be in April. The IRS extended it twice. It was extended to, to October 16th, and then they extended it again to November 16th. So the legislative analyst went in, 
estimating about $47 billion of revenue in their May revise that didn't appear. We projected about $43 billion in revenue, 42.9, that didn't appear. We weren't that far off on our guesstimates, but we had a blindfold on, both of us, all of us. And so last year we balanced a budget that would have been a little higher, significantly higher, the deficit, and we would have attended to most of those issues in that May revise and that balanced budget, but we didn't know because we weren't privy to that information that every other state and historically all prior budgets uh, had benefited from. So when we finally got those receipts in, we immediately moved to advance some of these efficiency efforts and to continue the work we're doing. And by the way, you may recall a couple years ago, even when things were good, we reduced overall efficiency of government services by 5%. And it's annualizing hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it was 239 million the first year. I don't know where it is today, but the point is, we've long, I, I love everyone lecture me, we should, you should belt tighten like, well, that's exactly what we've been doing. And so we extended even more efforts in November and December. So that is top line on that. Here's a little bit more of what you came to understand. We've got fund shifts, 3.4 billion. Again, I, I'm gonna let Joe and the team get through all these details, but it is 3.4 billion. Uh, the climate, maintain 89% of the overall commitment, roughly 90%, but there is some uh, reductions, particularly because we got all that federal dollars, all those new, new monies. We got infill infrastructure housing, remember $40 billion since 2019 in housing. 40 billion, unprecedented. California's never invested in housing. Uh, we're going to make some adjustments on some of these planning regional grants and fill infrastructure grants. Uh, 700, I think it's what, 762 uh, on vacant positions? 762.5 is, I think, my. If I'm off, it's because they shook their head, but they didn't give me the number. Uh, but I think it's 762.5 million. Uh, just on vacant position savings, school facilities, program still has a billion dollars, but we're gonna pull some money back. And we also have a school bond uh, that will be out uh, as well. So that's, that's part of the belt tightening uh, in terms of that balance. Now on delays and deferrals, that's the third category. Uh, these are, again, just delays and deferrals. You know, transit, it's the capital, still have a billion dollars. The facilities grant program you see I talked about, so you already know about that. Some of these clinic grants, uh, again, the team will get into the details on some of these things, but just delayed a little bit. You know, not denied, just delayed. Again, most of this came from abundance beyond our wildest expectation, and we're just gonna push it out a little bit in order to get where we need to go. So again, there's your, your list, uh, and this adds up uh, to the number. It allows us to put $3.4 billion of money into that line of credit, that checking account, as well and continue to make investments in our long-term unfunded liabilities. So that is this year's presentation. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it goes without saying that I hope we all considered a lot of the reporting on this, a lot of the punditries didn't wait. You know, I, I, I think my mom told me, seek first to understand before you're understood as opposed to ready, fire, aim. It's ready, aim, fire. Yeah. I can keep going. <laughs> uh, and uh, and, and I, I, hope, I hope it's reflected in a deeper understanding of where we are. Now, you're gonna ask me a question, and I'll, I'll just close on this. I'm gonna do my best, a lot of numbers. Uh, you got the LAO that said, you're gonna ask, well, the LAO said it was this, and we've written about it 150 times as if it was true. You may not say the latter part of it, but you've written about it 150 times. And uh, editorials, everything. Someone, I think the Wall Street Journal for the sixth time in a row have talked about a wealth tax. It's like a broken clock, broken clock. And, uh, and so you got that roughly 68, a little short, shy of that. The difference is in three categories. One, we increased it by 3.4. And then we have three categories of different numbers. About $10 billion difference in Prop 98, 8 billion because 
of what came in was realized and collected under uh, the IRS uh, delay from the IRS delay, and then two billion that was adjusted in terms of our own projections that were different from the LA was going for. So ten billion there, three point four, ten billion. We have seven point eight billion, and this is something finance is privy to. Not everybody else; they at least are privy earlier, and that's what we refer to in the language of accountants, workload reduction, uh, which is a way of saying savings, more efficiency in terms of government operations. And we, uh, we estimate $7.8 billion less costs uh, than um, in that category. Uh, not than the LAO, because it's about $4.5 billion less than the LAO. And, and, and that's, they assume some savings. We assume more savings, uh, additional $4.5 billion. <laughs> And then the big one was the 15.3 billion on the revenue side, and and so here's here's and on that delta, let me say two things. We've got a six-year budget framework, the LAO finance. We kind of live in that prism. This is remarkable. Between the LAO and finance, we're off over a six-year period by just 2.5 billion dollars, which is extraordinary. I mean, we're basically we land exactly in the same place. We just have a difference of opinion in the short run versus the long run. They are, I don't mean this, and again, everybody, we all, we're all in this together. They're partners, and, uh, and I value their work. We just are a little less pessimistic than they are about the next year. And, you know, I don't live in a bubble. I live in reality. I've been out there, as you know, making a case for this economy. A lot of people are just making a case 24-7. They're, they they're trying to drag this economy. I think you had a ex-president yesterday who said he was hoping for bad news in the stock market and the recession. I mean, just, I'm glad he's, I, I respect the honesty. But there's people that have literally been talking down this economy and yet it continues to just we dominate the globe. And, and, and so we're just a little more optimistic than all the nay, naysayers. So uh, they're slightly more pessimists, not deeply pessimists. We, we don't assume a recession. They don't assume a recession. They, but they see indices. They see the prospects that it could happen are a little more likely than we do. And that, that's the difference on the, on the revenue side in the short term. And then they're a little more optimistic than we are in the back end. And I hope they're right and we're wrong. Um, and that will right itself. So that's the, the long-winded uh, delta. I, I've got a slide later if you want to go through that one more time. Uh, if you didn't get all that down, because I imagine that's going to be fundamentally a question, uh, why, why the Delta? Uh, but I just want to close, I'm not talking about the Delta, though proud of the AR, uh, but, uh, and the importance of that project, but just uh, to thank my team. This has been a hard year, and this is, you can tune out on this. This is just for me and my team. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to be charitable. Uh, it's interesting. You recall this time last year we were dealing with unprecedented flooding. I came in with a baseball hat and was heading down to uh, the Central Coast this time last year. Little did we know that those extreme weather patterns would lead to this extreme volatility in financial projections because we didn't think through or even consider that the IRS would delay taxes in 55 of the 58 counties in the state of California on multiple occasions. In, in one occasion, we read about it. And, and we're sitting here going, wait a second, we, we got to pull this budget together. And not just for the May revise. And I was very, you can go back to that May revise presentation, and sometimes it would be good to listen, <laughs> making the point around this uncertainty. And, so, and, and it also was reflected in all those vetoes that everyone loves to hate, uh, where I said, we can't afford to do this. Imagine if we had signed off on all that. And so we're getting through that, and, and hopefully we're on the other side of that. And, uh, and this has been a, a, uh, a very challenging experience for the team. And, and because they just collected the revenue, I mean, just getting this to the printer, moving this thing, getting it to you, getting this presentation up uh, was uh, done in a very short period of time during the holidays. So. Uh, just hats off to Team Finance, to uh, all their hard work, Joe and Erica, thank you, uh, to uh, 
those poor souls like Jason Elliott that get burdened with putting the slide presentation together and, uh, and working through and, and uh, team comms and Anthony York who's been doing this magnificent job all this time uh, for us and, uh, and trying to wield, our, our, are you supporting a wealth tax? No, yet again. Why the hell do you keep writing about that? That wasn't just for the Wall Street Journal editorial board. You know how many calls I got about that? The damage they intentionally, knowingly do? I said it. They'll deny that, and there'll be five extra editorials attacking me for saying that. But they know that because every year I say that. <laughs> every year I say it. I don't know what more we can say. Um, I think it's shameful because I think it's done very intentionally. It's not truth seekers. It's ideological warriors. And I say this guy loves the news side of Wall Street Journal. I think it's one of the best. But that editorial board, it's a broken clock. <laughs> they do it over and over and over again to damage this state. I have too much pride and love for my state. And uh, I'm sorry to state it so emphatically, and I, I, I know I've done this long enough to know when you do that, you'll pay a price. <laughs> but the state's been paying a price for the misrepresentation and lies that are advanced every single day about this state and the state of the state, the health of the state, its resiliency, its vibrancy, its entrepreneurial spirit, its energy. And so I, I'm, I'm here as a you know, future ex-governor, loves this damn state, everything it represents, all its imperfections. And don't think for a second we're not honest and transparent about those imperfections. We're taking them on in historic ways, and we're trying everything we can, flood the zone to address those issues. But one of the issues that remains in this state is, uh, you know, just the constant and never-ending assault on our values and the things that I hold, and I think the vast majority of Californians hold dear. So I'm, I'm for brand California, and I'm going to be a little bit more pointed, a little bit more aggressive in making the case and, and some of the reporting around the last few weeks related to this budget and presentation uh, I, I think has is, is, is done some harm and uh, so I hope that's considered and if that's your story so be it uh, but I hope the story is one of resilience um, and it's also a story that again in closing as I began recognizes this is a story of correction and normalcy and one that we, in some respects, anticipated, the acuity, perhaps not, and one we're certainly prepared to work through. So thank you all so much for your time and attention, and I think there are one or two people that may have some questions uh, about this. Thank you.